and the HTML here. I guess I should probably ask, does it actually help anybody to have the current week highlighted in red on our homepage? Is that helpful? I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's not too big of a deal. No, it's not. I just have to go in and we're in week we're in week nine now, so the danger button is the red button. <laughs> Oh, okay. You changed something in here. Where did you see this primary? Okay. I'll look to the lab report for the Birmingham case. Would it be okay if I turn it in like tomorrow morning? Get it in when you can. Okay, cool. We just have an engagement tonight, so I'll try to finish it. I got most of it done, except for all the ones where I'm working. Yeah, uh, get it, get it in. I'd rather have it complete in a day or two late cool. than than able to complete on time. All right. Let's. The random question about plastic waste. Um, there are some, so this is the, the Google keyword you want to look for to look for things like this would be chemical recycling. Most of the recycling that's done, even if you use chemicals to do it, like to, to um, dissolve plastics and then recast them, that's still considered physical recycling because you still get the same particles at the end. They're just not, they're in a different shape. Chemical recycling is the idea that you could take a polymer like plastic and turn it back into its precursors and then reuse it and then cast it into new uh, polymers from there. Uh, and it's really sort of still in its infancy. Um, not a whole lot has been done and not a whole lot of success, but there's more and more you see some stuff with that. The problem is, is that then you have to really get every type of plastic has to be separated um, really with a high degree of accuracy for it to work. Because if you try to use the same chemical digestion method on, you know, PEG versus PET, you're going to get different stuff mixed in there, and then then it's all worthless, and you got to separate it all out if it even worked in the first place. Um, so there is there is um, ways to go about that. One of the things though that's interesting is that plastics actually aren't that stable, which is why they'll burn. Okay, right. What the reason that plastics last so long in the environment is that there's nothing. There's no organisms that are that have evolved to break them down. I've heard of some mycelium they've been studying that produce an enzyme that can break it down so they can use it as food. But I didn't. We're like starting to that. see. We're starting to see culture. some microorganisms um, and maybe fungi. I hadn't heard that. I just did just see a headline. But I didn't think it was a fungus. I thought it was a caterpillar or something. I thought it was like an yeast. <laughs> there's there's some bacteria that have, that have evolved to, that have learned to digest certain types of plastic that they've seen in landfills. There's some some fungus would be another candidate, and probably and yeasts are in there with bacteria. They're eukaryotes, but um, very small microorganisms with a very short lifespan. So things are adapting. Like when they say all oh, these things, like plastics will live forever in our landfills, that's not actually true. That's just you know human centric thinking. Um, and ignoring some of the, some of the other microbes that are out there. Um, and so there's definitely a possibility of doing that. That will generally return it to atmospheric CO2. They do break it down. Um, so it's not helping with, with climate change per se, but it definitely would help with the waste issue. Um, and so really the, the holy grail is being able to take atmospheric CO2 and turn that into something useful. Because then you're pulling air, you know, pulling CO2 that's a problem for climate change already and using it to make something that's useful to humans. And so one way of doing that is would be to take, make a biofuel, um, like because that's what makes biofuels a carbon zero, a carbon neutral process, is that photosynthesis is pulling CO2 out of the air and then we're and then fermenting it and then turning it into a biofuel, and then when we burn the biofuel, we just return the CO to the air. It's carbon neutral, at least. Um, and then, But then there's some other 
ways you can do that now. And that process is called carbon fixing. The process of taking CO2 and it's carbon in its fully oxidized state and reducing it. Um, because when, as soon as you reduce carbon and CO2 into something else, then you've got a chemical precursor that you can use to make a lot of things. Um, and so that's really a holy grail type of problem as well. Um, is what they refer to it as in, um, in research circles. That's like a, everybody is working, who the, is working on, on carbon fixing is getting funding because it's a huge deal and it would be a game changer if it worked. It's one of those like, like coal fusion. Um, so there are, so chemical, chemical recycling and carbon fixing are the two ways that we're looking at to, to tackle both the plastics and the atmospheric CO2 issue. Um, more related, in competing reactions, more than one possible product is formed, meaning that under different conditions, we can make both elimination and substitution products at the same time. Correct. What are those conditions? For the most part, any conditions, you're going to get some small amounts of every product. Um, everything that can happen does happen. It just might be at a, such a small rate relative to, or equilibrium constant might favor the substitution product over the elimination product. So it might be at a million to one ratio, but all of those, and we're going to talk about these variables today, but all of those different conditions are sort of sliders that we can use to adjust what we're going to get. If we change the solvent this way, the nucleophile that way, then we're going to get, you know, we're going to favor the E1 product versus the SN1 product versus the SN2 product. So all of these are different sort of um, different tools we have to work with. So, yes, short answer. Yes, the conditions do vary depending on the major and minor product, or actually I would say that the other way around. The major and minor product of substitution elimination vary depending on conditions. Um, and then this was a question, this is the shortest question that I saw, um, but it's also the one that might be trickiest to answer. Um, can you have an, a rearrange an intermediate form as a result of rearrangement? Um, I mean, resonance structures, you, but they're not really intermediate. The intermediate, right? I mean, so I'm sure that there's something. It's not very common. And you can have one intermediate rearranged to another intermediate. And we see that with SN ones, but starting mm -hmm. from something stable, neutral, and having it rearranged is a little bit less common. And when it does, it, they typically are so exothermic um, that you usually wind up with, a, with it either happening all at once or the entire molecule blows apart into separate pieces. Gotcha. Um, I, and we'll, so I don't, I can't think of any specific examples. I'm sure it happens. I was just trying to think of like another pathway because all of the mechanisms we were playing with was either one movement of electrons, but rearrangement is the only one that we saw. There were two different pairs of electrons moving, so one of them moving would be that intermediate. I'm trying to go after, but yeah, it doesn't quite happen with that. So yeah, it, typically not. Typically, shorter pathways tend to be favored. Um, oh, keep that question in mind when you start looking at longer mechanisms, right. because it might be something if you're looking for it, you might see see what you're talking about, and it's just not presented that way in a textbook usually. Sure. And then uh, going over number three. So, which of these would we expect to be faster? We have similar reactions happening, right? The only thing that's different, we have same reactants, similar products, same leaving group, same solvent, presumably, since nothing else is, is um, described here. So what we really are looking at is our nucleophile. We have chloride as a nucleophile versus iodide as a nucleophile. So which of those is a stronger nucleophile, usually? Chlorine would be normally would be the stronger nucleophile, which would mean faster re rate, except we're doing this in a protic solvent. Mm -hmm. Ethanol is a protic solvent. 
which means chloride being closer to the same size as, as the oxygen on ethanol means that it's going to be surrounded by that solvent shell better. And that actually, so in a protic solvent with the halides, they flip their nucleophilicity, right? So normally chloride would be more a faster reaction here, but because it's in ethanol, the iodide is the faster reaction. Right, so, and again, I know that I asked you a question about a protic solvent. Remember that the protic solvents are the exception. Everything makes sense in terms of nucleophilicity and periodic trends and all that, unless it's a protic solvent. Right, so don't let this hang you up on that. Did that answer your question, Jerry? Yeah, no, that answered it. Like, I perfectly. Thank you. All right. And so here's a follow up with that. Here's our relative rate of chloride as a nucleophile in, in methanol, not ethanol, but still a protic solvent, right? Iodine was 43 times faster than bromide, and that's going to be a factor of 100 times faster than chloride. And if we switch that and we do it in an aprotic solvent, the relative reactivity switch. So the chloride then becomes a much faster nucleophile, stronger nucleophile than the iodide in an aprotic solvent. So this is our this is our, our standard case. That's the way we want to think about it, remember it. And then just remember that for the halides in a protic solvent, it's backwards. If that's the key, it has to be both of these. The strongest base will also be the strongest nucleophile and therefore the fastest reaction, unless both of these are true. If the reaction occurs in a protic solvent and the base is different in size, because it's actually the size of the nucleophile that winds up making the difference because of that solid shell. The bigger bases are not insulated as well. Would this be true to some extent for nucleophiles that are Lewis bases? Because I know they're steric hindrance, so like the protic solvent couldn't get in there as well, but it would still form some hydrogen kind of type bonds or like ion type bonds. So we would consider those with this additional steric forces. Those are also going to be um, differing in size. The nucleophile yeah. part of the molecule is the same size, but it's not as insulated in its solvent yeah. shell quite as well. But basically what we start seeing there is that they're really good bases, but not nucleophiles in the first place. And so we don't even think about gotcha. things like, like uh, T-butyl T -butyl alcohol um, is really a bad nucleophile because of all the steric hindrance, regardless of the solvent. All right, I think we did this one the other day. Um, the one thing I that will I will point out here to keep in mind is that those are our two most common aprotic solvents, our DMF and DMSO. There are a few other ones, but those are the ones for the most part that we'll use. And then anything that has a hydrogen attached to an oxygen is going to be a protic solvent. Anything where you've got a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen. It's a protic solvent. You can even get some really esoteric ones. You could, if you had liquid HCl as a solvent, that would be a protic solvent. That would be exceptionally unstable and rare on Earth, um, given how much water is around, but it still could work, right? That's still in that category of it could make a hydrogen bond. All right, so here's the, the final review here. SN2 rates, methyls are faster than primaries or faster than secondaries or faster than tertiary. SN1, exact opposite. If the reactant in the rate determining step is charged, more polar solvents lead to a slower reaction. And really it's, it's more about the protic cases. The protic solvents are the most the most polar. Um, and I think we actually wrote it down <laughs> better before. So I'm actually going to skip the bottom half of this slide.
Right, but here's the, the logic behind the solvent effects again, just because it's such a convoluted logic process that it's worth thinking about again. The, in all of these processes, the transition states are charged or have some, some polar character to them, right? So a polar solvent is going to stabilize all of the transition states, regardless of the mechanism. However, if we wind up with, if we have reactants that are more highly charged, then the more polar the solvent, the more protic the solvent, the slower the reaction will be because you wind up with this barrier being higher. And this difference in how much stabilization occurs means a larger barrier. And so in a less polar solvent, reactions tend to be faster. You need to be a polar solvent, but we don't want it to be so polar that it's protic. Protic solvents slow everything down, um, especially in nucleophilic substitutions. Right, so if we put it in a, and this is... Sorry, you said protic? Solvents slow things down and more polar or more and polar. more polar and protic is basically the extreme version of polar, right? So more non-polar would be faster made. Yes, to some extent, there's a crossover point because we also it still does need to be able to be polar enough that you can get a charged nucleophile to dissolve in it, right? So that's why these polar yet aprotic solvents wind up being such a key aspect because they're polar enough that you can stabilize the transition state and get your reactants dissolved, but they're not so polar that your reactants are too stable. So, and if we're, if we have reactants that are not as strong of nucleophiles that are not charged, then our, then our solvent doesn't matter as much. Right, all of our strongest nucleophiles had charges. So the stronger the nucleophile, the more important it is to pick the right solvent. If our, if our nucleophiles are neutral, then it doesn't matter nearly as much because they're not going to be stabilized nearly as much by these um, protic solvents. Um, and that especially applies when your reactant is your solvent. If we do the reaction in water and water is your nucleophile, then you really don't need to worry about the solvent shell or anything like that, right? Because what does it matter if it's that water or this water that actually does the reaction? So we see that a lot with, if, if we're gonna use an, a protic solvent, a lot of times the protic solvent itself will be the nucleophile because then, then we don't wind up with this big jump right here that slows things down. All right, so here's our competing mechanisms piece. SN2 mechanisms are favored by strong negatively charged nucleophiles in an aprotic solvent. If you're gonna have strong nuclear neutral nucleophiles, then they can be in a protic solvent but an aprotic is still going to be faster. Less substituted active carbons, so methyl over primary, primary over secondary, and don't even worry about SN2 if it's a tertiary leaving group. SN1 reactions are favored when we have weak nucleophiles or in a protic solvent. We tend to, because that protic solvent stabilizes, um, stabilizes that intermediate really well too, right? A more substituted active carbon. If you have resonance stabilization of your intermediate. If when your leaving group leaves, you wind up with a carbocation that's in the allylic position, then you can stabilize that intermediate really well, right? Basically for SN1, you need this weak nucleophile aspect and you need a 
good leaving group and you need that intermediate to be pretty stable. And even so, SM1s are much slower than SM2 because of that, that weak nucleophile. And all of our halides are pretty good leaving groups, but if you've got bromide or iodide, it's a really good leaving group. You got chloride as your leaving group, it's not as good. And there's some other leaving groups that are that we'll look at once we move past the halides, like water as a leaving group is a pretty good leaving group. But hydroxide as a leaving group is not. All right, so there's there's our big variables that we can use to sort of favor one direction versus another in terms of these reactions. Questions on these? Do we ever really see like an SM1 reaction in uh, an aprotic solvent where the carbocation cation can't be stabilized? As long as it's polar, okay. then you can see that, yeah. Especially if it's a tertiary carbon because it's not going to go any other way. Okay. Um, but what we'll see, there's some good summary PDF summary cheat sheets, basically. When, once we introduce an elimination, that's two more mechanisms, but they're tied to that substitution mechanisms. Once we introduce those, then we'll look, we'll basically break down some of these big cheat sheets that have all these variables in there. Um, and that kind of gives you a like, here's the general rule. You can you can make the assumption it's not going SN2 if this. You, it must be SN1 if this. Um, and so we'll we'll have some good tools that we'll break down that we'll use for studying too. All right, so here's some practice. We've got a, a, a pKa table. We've got, and if if you would expect the product, so we'll write out the products, but then we're going to look at which side is favored in equilibrium as well. And to force myself to give you enough time to discuss this and look at this, I'm going to take five minutes to go back to my office and get my coffee mug.
So quiet, everybody's still writing, so. All right, so for this first one, about mechanism first, SN1 or SN2? SN2. SN2, why? Um, using an aprotic solvent. An aprotic solvent, charged nucleophile. Charged nucleophile, strong. It's a good leaving group, but that doesn't really fix it either way, right? But, uh, and it's on a secondary carbon, which again, isn't a deciding factor either way. What the where the leaving group is should almost always be the first thing you look at because that's the easiest way. It doesn't matter about solving yeah. effects if it's a primary carbon. Of course, I didn't give you any of the easy ones on this slide, right? <laughs> um, so SN2 makes the most sense. Charged nucleophile, a protic solvent, good leaving group. So which means our product is just going to look like. There would still be some SN1 going on though, right? Because I mean, we have a really good leaving group and DMF is still polar. Right, and, and cyanide's all the way down here. Yeah. It's not a great, it's charged, so we think of it as a strong nucleophile, but as far as the major product, yeah, right. we would expect it to be the SN2 product. It also, you know, even the SN1 is gonna give some of this as the major product as well, right? Because there's no rearrangement happening or anything. Yeah. Um, so this would definitely be the major product and most of it through SN2. How about here? SN1. 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 Neutral. Neutral. We, exactly. Protic solvent. If it doesn't have both a, a reactive and a solvent, then you can assume this is, a, especially since we know water is liquid, mm -hmm. we can assume that the water is both the solvent and the nucleophile in this case. So SN1, any rearrangement to worry about? No. So our products, multiple products would be uh, water. Yeah. And the 
first product anyway would look like this, and then it would kick off the hydrogen would kick off when it would turn into, into an alcohol, right? And we would get both enantiomers. Um, I know I talked about you could draw it without showing any stereochemistry and just say R plus S. So like with the first one as well, you could, could you show it with both? No, because SN2, you only get one enantiomer. Oh, okay. Because it only it does so activation it, placement. Right. Okay. For SN1, you're going to get the mixture of the two. And the other, so the other way that you okay. could write that would be, you could write it like I did. Mm -hmm. Pick one of them, and then you can write plus EN to signify plus yeah. enantiomer. Okay. Um, the other way to do that is just show it without showing any stereochemistry. Just draw a line. And then just say R plus S. R plus S. But basically, you need to do something to indicate to me that, that you understand that you're going to get both enantiomers in, a, in about a 50 50 mixture. With the SN1. With the SN1, yeah. All right, how about this last one? Not as good of a leaving group, but also a pretty weak nucleophile. A protic solvent. This is this is in that 50-50 range. You'd probably go SN2 just because SN2, if all other things being equal, SN2 is just faster. It's faster. Um, and more favorable with the A protic. And we, and we're in an aprotic solvent, so yeah, yeah. SN2, when in doubt, go with SN2. SN1s are actually pretty rare unless it's a tertiary carbon. So SN2 means that. So when you identify a tertiary carbon, are you talking about it before or after the leaving group? It's ter tertiary refers to how many carbons are attached to it, not the leaving group itself, not just how many bonds does it have. Hmm. So secondary would just have two carbons. Right? Exactly. So this is a secondary carbon. Tertiary would be if you have three carbons and the chlorine. Gotcha. Um, and you can't have a quaternary carbon in an SN2. You can have a quaternary carbon, but not in an SN2 because it can't have a leaving group if it's got four other carbons attached to it. Right. <laughs> um, and so we don't spend that much time talking about quaternary carbons because they're not actually all that reactive because they're always, they're attached to four other carbons and carbon-carbon bonds don't break that easily. We'll talk about quaternary nitrogens, quaternary amines, because an amine can act at, can act, wind up forming four bonds and making a rather, rather reactive molecule because you wind up with a nitrogen with a positive charge, but four carbons attached to it. Um, so quaternary amines are a thing that we pay attention to. And we'll use the term quaternary from time to time to talk about carbon. They do have some interesting chemistry that can happen. It's just a little bit more rare. The angles got a little wonky so that I had enough room to write everything. But it's the oxygen on the methanol that's going to come in here. Backside displacement in the chlorine leaves. So we wind up with the oxygen coming out of the board towards us. Chlorine leaving out, out the back door. And then, so just like with the water, initially our product would look like that. That's a positive charge on an oxygen. So it's just going to, that turns this into an acidic proton. And you just wind up kicking that hydrogen off as the sort of secondary step. When we're doing this on a test, generally speaking, we're not going to want to leave an oxygen with a positive charge in our product. I would want you to show that next step as well, because it's not going to stop here. But we'll get to the point where that's second nature, where you don't even barely need to think about that. All right, so questions on this page. As long as we're all working as a group and I'm the one up here with the marker, everything's good, right? So 
the more practice, the more times you see it, the more it'll make sense, the more you'll be able to replicate it, right? There's no substitute for repetition. That's got copy and paste wrong. That's what I don't know what happened with that one. Um, <laughs> let's look at, let me, let me fix this slide real quick because I can clean that up. We don't actually need. I must have just copy, copy and pasted the wrong thing there. I'm just going to get rid of all that and this because this is what I actually want to look at. All right. So we did one very similar to this just a second ago, right? What was our conclusion for the mechanism? SN2. SN2, right? All of the things being equal, go SN2. It's just faster usually. Which means drawing the product is just as simple as it was a second ago, right? Instead of the bromine sticking out, we'll have the ether sticking into the board. Everybody remembers all of your functional group names as well, right? So we're going to start introducing more and more of them. Does the fact that this is in a lilic position, is that going to change anything? If it's SN2? Not if it's SN2. Not if it's SN2. If it's SN1, then we get resonance happening, right? And actually, considering this was a mechanism where with these variables, we said uh, it's kind of a toss up. The resonance, you could you could make the argument, and I wouldn't mark you down on a test. Because this has resonance that stabilizes the intermediate enough to actually get it to favor SM1. And then you get a totally different product of the alpha carbon being the tertiary. With the alpha carbon, yeah. So what will happen here? So let's look at this one's pure SM1, right? There's not there's barely any competing here. So our intermediate is going to look like this with a resonance structure. That's going to look like this, right? Now, all of a sudden, it's a tertiary carbocation. One of the resonance structures is a tertiary carbocation. So out of these two, which is the more significant resonance structure? The tertiary. The tertiary. It's more stable, right? So that means that this is the intermediate will actually, that will actually give us our major product. And that's what David was talking about. Because the, our, we have one resonance structure noticeably more stable than the other resonance structure, the more significant resonance structure is going to be the one that actually reacts. So wind up with water then coming in here, attaching there. And our final product And we'll get the R and the S version of this. All right. So rearrangements and resonance matter much more for S and one. And can all can be the tip if you. I, this is again one of those things where you should tell me your logic on the test. Because there is there is a right answer, which if these if for this first one if it's SN1 or SN2. But there's so many competing variables and you're still in the process of learning them. Show me that you understand that all the variables are there. Like, okay, I think it's about 50-50, but we've got this resonance stabilizing the intermediate. Therefore, I'm going to assume it's going to go SN1. You write that in there, I can give you full credit for that answer because you're not wrong. Even if numerically it winds up being that oh, SN2 still is the dominant one, you're right to be considering all those variables at that point. Okay. 
It's another case of chemistry doesn't give you hard yeses and nos. It's a lot, and this is one of the things that's tricky about OCHEM, why OCHEM has such a, a reputation for being a hard class is because there are very few absolutes. Everything is well, usually. <laughs> All right, we're going to get into elimination reactions. We've been at this for 45 minutes, and we're, would you rather see the mechanism and then take a break, or take a break before we go into something new? I'd rather take a break and then go into it. I would tend to go that way as, much, as well. So let's take a break. We'll come back. <laughs> come back at five till, and we'll uh, and we'll talk about elimination, like all that substitution digest.
Anyone get up to anything fun this weekend? No. <laughs> Camping on. Oh, there you go. Right in it. Yeah, that's fun. The broom said, like, it was pretty mellow. I mean, just had yeah. a massive fire. That's what I was out there for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just had a fire. Nice. Took some food and, yeah, sleeping cold. <laughs> yeah, that's not as fun to go camping now. Right. We beat the snow. <laughs> I have a feeling this winter is going to be pretty heavy. It's already snowed like this in mid November. Well, yeah. yeah. It's a big first snow, though. Yeah. I never expected. I mean, like last year it snowed on Halloween. Yeah. Kind of like this. Yeah. And then it all was going to melt in the next day. Yeah. It does have a feeling of a hunch. See, so, oh, wow. wow. I hope it's massive. I need to warm this up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just tired of snow clearing. <laughs> so my mom and grandma live in Pioneer. Go down there over the weekends. I'm like, we're remodeling right now, so I'm doing that. But like two years ago, we got like a massive snowstorm, and we have a long driveway, so we have a snowblower. But I was, I remember there was one time I spent six days in a row, like eight hours every day on the snowblower, and it got to the point where the berms were so high, the snowblower was like not even clearing them. So I was having to like, I cleared a huge area, but then I was having to like narrow it down. <laughs> I was like, I hope it stops. You gotta clear a hole from the back side of the berm and then start shooting through the hole. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I worked up at Sierra for like six months. Pretty much, yeah. The storms you're talking about, yeah. I was at the top of the mountain, clearing off the roof of that building. Nice. And uh, so it's like 16 by 30 by probably six feet high. So, yeah. so I'm just out there just clearing snow, throwing it off of the roof. Right. <laughs> but by the time I'm done with the roof, everything that's below all the doors are shut. Yeah. yeah so so I have to clear everything. Yeah. 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 I'm scared of the snow. I used to live in my truck too, and uh, I just recently got a window on my camper shell. Oh, nice. But when I was living in it, I didn't have a window. Oh, so impressive. I wake up like two feet of snow on my feet. I love snow camping. I've never like built an igloo and always just dig down. Get like a wind break and set up the tent and everything there. But I've never, I've never put in the effort to like build a whole ass here. Do you take a class here? Oh, oh yeah. we have, we have uh, winter wilderness survival training. You can get units yeah. to go snow camping and get taught by some professionals. Like well, you do it every day, <laughs> the final exam is okay. We're going out. Nobody freeze to death. Exactly. Yeah. I actually, it's it's pretty cool. We usually wind up getting um someone from the Naval Warfare Center to teach it from the because the Winter Warfare Center is like past Strawberry up in the mountains. Um, so it's relatively close, and we used to have a lot of good connections with uh, with the Marines that were actually training there, and so we'd have some, one of their instructors come teach it, um, which is kind of cool too, like you know military style, like from nothing. You have a parachute cord and and uh, you know a piece of fabric. <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Drop it off. Figure it out. Figure yeah. You know, I have to chop off some branches, make some cover, make a little we'll see you at the car in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> now they did have there was something that's that um somebody somebody fell asleep and their fire went out and they were they're were like gonna freeze to death. But the, oh, yeah, the instructors just stay up all night and make the rounds and check on everybody every 15 minutes because you know, we don't really want students to die. We have enough trouble getting students. We don't need like we're not really dying while they're here. All right, let's talk about elimination. Yeah. Uh, chemical elimination, right? Not about students. <laughs> All right. So elimination is is basically it still comes back to the same general principles of alkyl halides, good weaving groups, 
solvent effects, all of these things. Um, it's basically just a fork where something that can be a good nucleophile can also be a good base. And if it's a good base, it can pull a proton off of a molecule instead of making a new carbon bond. So a substitution reaction, your leaving group leaves, and, and you wind up with this coming in here, your nucleophile coming in here to grab that, or to make that new bond through a nucleophilic attack. The difference with elimination is just instead of forming a new bond here, you wind up grabbing one of these hydrogens. And if I blow this up a little bit to look at, the individual bonds that are involved here. And X is, is oftentimes just used as a placeholder for any halide, right? Basically, if, if your leaving group is leaving and taking electrons with it, a base could come in here and grab that hydrogen, but that's not, that hydrogen's not gonna bring the electrons with it, right? Because Carbon is more electron negative than hydrogen. So that basically lets these electrons move over towards the leaving group carbon. So it's not that we're pulling a hydrogen off of the same carbon. We actually have two active carbons in an elimination reaction. So could there be three steps here? The leaving group leaves the rearrangement and then or so, could we leave the, the nucleophilic attack and then rearrangement, right? So we would say if this can, this would be a one concerted step, the way I have it drawn here, right? But we can have leaving group leaves and then the base comes in and pulls a hydrogen off. That, so that's the equivalent of a stepwise process for elimination. So we call that E1, it's first order. Gotcha. So we just like with SN1 versus SN2, we have E1 and E2 for the same reason. You can make if you can make a stable intermediate and you don't have a strong nucleophile or strong base, you can get leaving group leaves first and then the next step, whether that's a nucleophilic attack or a proton transfer. That's really the only difference between elimination and substitution is whether that second step or it can be concerted, whether that is um, nucleophilic attack or proton transfer. If it's proton transfer, you leave those electrons behind and they make a pi bond. If it's a nucleophilic attack, <clears throat> that would be coming in here and then you're leaving that hydrogen alone and you just get a substitution. All right, so the net result is you wind up with your base turns into the conjugate acid and you get a new um, a new carbon-carbon pi bond and your leaving group leaves. The leaving group leaves is the same net result in both of these. It's just what are the, what's the new bond that you make between the nucleophile? Is it a carbon bond or is it a hydrogen bond? All right, so traditionally we see elimination reactions happening when we have alkyl halides and strong nucleophiles. Why would that be the case? That seems like it should be SN2. Why would we see elimination as well? What is it? What's like the, like the acid-base reactions that are going on? Exactly. So because it, if it's a strong nucleophile, it's also usually a strong base. And so you can have, you know, a, a it's not random necessarily, but you are going to get a mixture of both elimination and substitution products in most of these cases. But again, we can change how strong the base is, how strong of a nucleophile it is, what solvent we're in, what leaving group we have, what temperature Temperature winds up playing a role when we're deciding between substitution and elimination for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. But in general, this is just one more factor that goes into this, right? So we've got SN1, SN2, E1, E2. 
right? So just like before, if it's a first order reaction, it's happening in multiple steps and we call it E1. If it's second order, it's a concerted reaction and we call it E2. So reactions that, or reaction conditions that would favor SN2 also tend to favor E2 out of these for the same reasons, it's the same mechanisms really, right? So the only deciding whether it's gonna go substitution or elimination, once you know whether it's first order or second order, that's a different set of, of um, not a different set of variables, but that's a, a different decision-making process. Um, so the, we've already mentioned a lot of these. How can elimination be first or second order? Well, it can be concerted or it can be stepwise, right? If your first step is leaving group leaves and you make a carbocation intermediate, that's a first order reaction, regardless of if it's elimination or substitution. If it's E1 or SN1, the first step is identical for both of them, right? It's leaving group leaves. And if there's any rearrangement that to be done, then you do that. All right, we've talked about naming alkenes already, so we're not going to spend much time on this. Some of this is just holdover from um, older, older times when I've taught this class, but just as a review, there are two ways you can write the name or the number for these. You can put the number in the middle of that. Butene um, sounds a little bit weirder than one butene to most people. But nobody's going to look at you funny in the chemistry world if you say you one they know what you mean, right? And that's the whole point of nomenclature. The other one that we haven't talked about yet that, I'll, that we will add is you can have a diene. This is exactly what it sounds like. A diene just means you have two alkene groups. And just like with dimethyl, we specify where each of them are. So one three butadiene. Well, there's our butene group. One butene. One three butadiene. Um. So not chirality, stereochemistry. Chirality is very specifically means the four things in three dimensions. So the right-handed versus the left-handed. Cis-trans isomerism is it still stereochemistry, but not chirality. That the cis-trans isomers don't rotate polarized light. Chiral um, stereoisomers do something about the way that the four objects in three-dimensional space interact with light passing through them is specific to chirality. And cis-trans isomerism doesn't affect that at all, which is weird. It has to do with the fundamental nature of reality some, on some level. We understand like the physics behind that, or is that just like- Yes. Um, basically when, <laughs> when light passes through a material, it's interacting with the electron clouds in that material. Um, and it, you can think of it as being absorbed and re-emitted constantly as it moves through that material. But if that material is right-handed versus left-handed, that can cause that when it gets re-emitted, it kind of rotates. It's sort of the way that if you pass, if you pass wind through a windmill, windmill spins right but it also creates currents in the wind itself is the the without digging too much into matrix operators and and uh the physical chemistry <laughs> the physics of it um that's the best way to think about it is that the wind gets rotated as well when it passes through a wind turbine Uh, we talked about system trans E and Z, so this is what I want to get to. All right, so 
which one of these is E1 and which one's E2? E2 would be the first one. Yeah. Right, exactly. And this step looks the same whether it's elimination or substitution. And this looks a little bit more complex. E2 looks a little bit more complex than SN2 because you have this extra arrow in the middle. But it's really pretty similar, right? And if you still wind up with it doing a backside attack, essentially, except it's just grabbing a hydrogen from the opposite side as the, as the leaving group instead of attacking the carbon. And if this was SN2, it would be going there and you can leave off that middle arrow. Right. And then this one has the same thing, the leaving group leaves, and then we get two arrows. The key is with the two arrows is that your base has to grab the proton, and then that leaves a pair of electrons that can move over towards the carbon of the leaving group. Right, so that is something that's, that people struggle with sometimes. With substitution, it's all about the active carbon, right? Everything's happening to the active carbon. With elimination, you've got the active carbon, which is the carbon that has the leaving group. But then you also have the base moving towards the second carbon over, which we call the alpha carbon. Um, different textbooks will use that term a little bit differently, so I'm going to try to be consistent within this class at least. There's the active carbon, and the alpha carbon is the first carbon past that. Some textbooks will call the active carbon the alpha carbon. And the carbon next to it's the beta carbon. But again, it gets a little bit hazy. So I'm going to try to be consistent internally with this class and just know that that's a, that's a, a pain point in the future when you go take more of it. <laughs> so is this still considered a concerted, both of these still considered mm -hmm. concerted? These are stepwise? No, the top one is concerted. Bottom one is stepwise, mm -hmm. just like SN1 and SN2. Even though you could break it down into more steps? Like two carbocations, even though it's not stable, it still has to happen in the floor. Well, you're never really going to have two carbocations on this one. Right. Yeah, you just have an electron shift over here. Right. And if anything, you could consider it carbanion. Right. Because, but it had these two steps wind up being in a concerted uh, fashion. You wind up with your proton transfer and the electrons moving simultaneously. This one, all three of these arrows are happening at the same time. That's the key with these with these mechanisms. Is if you're showing more than one arrow, uh, electron pair of electrons moving at a time, that's all happening simultaneously. If there's any point where you have an intermediate where it stops and then something else has to happen, then you draw an arrow and make another step. So just to just to clarify on our, our, our nomenclature, so in that bottom reaction, that carbocation would be the active carbon, and then the one on which the hydrogen right. attached base attack would be the alpha. I would call that the alpha carbon. Okay. Because and I'm trying to be consistent too, because when there's a whole chapter on alpha carbon, they call it alpha carbon chemistry. When you have carbonyls. This is the alpha carbon, and that's the carbonyl part. Okay. Um, and so I'm going with that nomenclature. There's the important carbon, and then there's one carbon removed, which also winds up being of secondary importance in a lot of these reactions. Is beta still used in that? Um, we would say the beta carbon would be here. Right. Um, and so, and you can have two alpha carbons. Both of these would be alpha carbons. Um, and actually, this that's the same nomenclature um, that we use in the same basic principle that we use in fatty acid chains in nutrition. Um, basically, if, we, if you have a big, long fatty acid chain and you're not sure how long it'd be or you want to make it a more general term, um, the alpha carbon is at the, at the end that has the acid group. And then how, regardless of how long the acid chain is, the final carbon is the omega carbon. So that's actually where we get the term omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. Is basically 
the omega carbon minus three has a, a carbon carbon five bond, has an alkene group, or the omega carbon minus six. And those are, as categories wind up being important nutritionally because we can't make them, but we need them. Um, so that's why they, they are considered vitamins, essential nutrients, because we can't make them. But and it has to do with um, our body can make unsaturated fatty acids, but not omega-3 fatty acids and not omega-6 fatty acids. We can make omega-9 fatty acids in our bodies. We can't make the threes and the sixes. Yeah. So yes, the terminology, you know, when you see Greek letters in organic chemistry, a lot of the time we're talking about how many carbons removed from an active carbon. Um, and that's, I actually had that on there to talk about. So uh, in some, just as, you know, to uh, the other phrase that you see, if you've got a carbonyl, A lot of times, if you have this set up where you've got a carbonyl and then adjacent so that it can resonate, you have a pi bond that creates a different type of reactivity. And so they'll actually refer to alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls are specifically talking about you've got a carbonyl and then between alpha and beta, you also have a pi bond because that creates that resonance as well. So alpha and beta are the most important. Omega gets used mostly in biochemistry and in, and in nutrition, um, but it comes from the same root. This is basically, we're reaching the point where the organic chemists and the biochemists started figuring out things together instead of figuring them out separately and then fighting about the wording. All right, so we've talked about stereochemistry. We've talked about what's called a stereoselective reaction. We didn't use that term, but a stereoselective or stereospecific reaction means that you favor making one stereoisomer over another. So SN2 was our stereospecific reaction because we only made one stereoisomer, right? And SN1 we said was not stereoselective at all. all right, and just to um, just to clarify, you can have stereospecific means you only get one stereoisomer. Stereoselective means that you can get both, but you favor one. <clears throat> Make both. but favor one. And here you only make one. So regioselective is slightly different because regioselective mean, is talking about, okay, we can, when we're making a new pi bond, a new alkene, we can make it between carbon one and carbon two or between carbon two and carbon three. So we're making a different constitutional isomer. So regioselective reactions are talking about, okay, well, out of these two options, I can make the I can make one butene or I can make two butene, which them is going to be favored. Um, you can have regiospecific reactions where you only make one isomer, uh, but there's those are a little bit more specific of a reaction. Um, if the beta carbons are identical, sorry, if the alpha carbons are identical, being consistent within my own slides, the alpha carbons are identical, there's only one product formed. Right? If this carbon and this carbon are the same, it doesn't matter which of them makes the pi bond, right? Because we have the same product either way. It doesn't matter if our base attacks here or there, we're gonna get pentene either way, cyclopentene either way. As soon as there's a difference between one side versus the other, 
now that means that there's two different products that can form, right? We could make this product or we could make this product. That would be more favorite. Why? Tertiary carbon capital. So, but that doesn't apply to to E two. So even even though E two doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate, and actually either way, if it goes through E one. You leave your group leaves. You make a carbocation intermediate, and then it would rearrange, and then um, the second step would actually not be regio selective because then you wind up with both of the carbons being identical from the intermediate. But even the concerted reaction, even the second order reaction, winds up with a difference between these two, where this one is favored. We make this version, but it's not as stable. I think I have the numbers here. So here's a different reaction, a similar result, right? Our bromine's on the tertiary leaving group, so it doesn't matter SN1 or SN2 because there's no rearrangement. But either way, we wind up with favoring this molecule over that one. Why would that be the case? I mean, it must be because we're doing something. It's either going to come down to sterics or there's something about alkene stability. I'm just thinking uh, high volume, closer to the half of the <laughs> molecule, the middle of it. The middle of the molecule? Yeah. And why? Just because the electron is more dispersed throughout the molecule. Yeah, so more substituted alkenes are more stable. Okay. So it, it follows, it's similar, it's not the same as carbocat instability, but it's similar. So when in doubt, you're going to make the more substituted alkene. Um, which kind of seems backwards according to sterics. Sterics are basically the one thing that can get this to go the other way. You can make the less substituted alkene by choosing your base carefully. If you have a, a big, bulky, sterically hindered base, it'll actually reverse these ratios. If I took F oxide and I replaced it with T butoxide, so instead of this, if I used add this big T butyl group to it, then it's too big to actually get to the middle. And so you can't take this car or this hydrogen off when you have the big bulky group. Um, but basically all this is saying is that the alkene stability favors the more substituted, even though sterics favor the less substituted. And you can make sterics the more important factor by exaggerating them, by making, they call it a sterically hindered base. <clears throat> if, right. that was, right. if that was E1, would we then have three possible products? If this was E1? Yeah. Um, if this was E1, then Romy leaves, you make a carbocation, this one won't rearrange. Yeah, no rearrangement, but the backside is actually different for. Not for elimination. Not for elimination. Because it base because these two are identical, right? So it doesn't matter which of them it attacks. Right. Gotcha. But yes, you do have to pay attention to that. If you wind up with three different alpha carbons, then you can wind up with three different products. And you're going to preferentially make the one that's the most substituted. And if you have two that are equally substituted, then you basically would use sterics as your tiebreaker. All right, so this rule is called, and the spelling depends.
depends on what textbook you get it from um, because it's a Russian name. So sometimes you see it with a B instead of two Fs and sometimes the Y is an I. Um, actually, I think that might be the more common way. Zaitsev. Zaitsev's role is when you're doing an elimination reaction, you're going to see the, you're usually going to see the more substituted alkene as the major product. So we'll also refer to this as the Zaitsev product. Um, and the, the chemist who figured out how to preferentially make the less substituted, his name was Hoffman. He's one of, there's at least four Hoffmans that actually have their names in organic chemistry textbooks. Um, and I can't remember which one this one was because it's, there's two Fs, two Ns, two Fs, one N, one F, two Ns, one F, one N are all the different Hoffmans. Um, I don't remember which one this was, but I think this was two Fs, one N. Really complicated. All the, all the German chemists, all the German organic chemists, it seemed like half of them were named Hoffman. <laughs> Fun fact from the science of the root science means rabbit. Okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I'd like to do that. So I was gonna also say as a as a human, Rus Russian chemists in general in the 1800s seemed like they were kind of um how can I put this? Dicks. Is it, but they, they were just not kind humans in general. Like um, Mendeleev, the guy who invented the periodic table, never got an element named after him until not only was he dead, but everybody who had ever known him personally was also dead before they actually got could name an element after him. This is the guy who invented the periodic table. And he not only did he never win a Nobel Prize, he never even got an element named after him until a hundred years after he was dead because he was that much of a jerk. Um, Zaitsev and he had, his rival was in the same research group in St. Petersburg, I think St. Petersburg, um, was uh, Markovnikov. Zaitsev and Markovnikov, Markovnikov was older um, and basically was gatekeeping Zaitsev, like you don't deserve to be here. Um, he waited until uh, he would basically try to block Zaitsev from getting his degree and being able to continue his studies. Um, and so then Zaitsev had the last lap, though, because Markovnikov had this big series of papers. He had three papers he was going to publish, boom, 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 be the definitive work on um, addition reactions. And Zaitsev knew that he was making a fundamental misunderstanding in paper number two and didn't say anything until after he published it, so just so that he could make him retract it. He could, it, they worked 12 feet from each other. He could have just told him, <laughs> he could have just told him, but no, he waited for him to publish it so that he could be like, uh-uh. <laughs> They're very petty, very clever about being petty. Probably fucked it. Yes, it could be, I don't know, just the cold. Yeah. Also, Markovnikov, Mar 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 mm -hmm. carrot is the root of that one. That's really carrot, great. rabbit, carrot. Yeah, wow, <laughs> that actually does tie together. I had no idea. All right, um, we'll talk about Markovnikov because Markovnikov had a uh, his own rule. The Markovnikov rule applies to addition reactions that we'll get into next quarter. So we're doing this. Now that I think about it, that's probably why that other textbook does the addition reactions first is because they chronologically, historically, were studied first. So you would learn Markovnikov and then learn Zaitsev um, because that's the order. But to me, again, substitution elimination go hand in hand and make more sense to study those first, then get into the addition reactions, which basically undo elimination reactions. All right, so with that in mind, take Seb's rule in mind, make the more substituted carbon whenever you can. Right, if there are two, predict all elimination products, 
and then pick which one's the major product for these. And there might only be one product, there might be only be two, there might be up to four. And assume all of them are E2. So we're not dealing with rearrangements right now. It's just bromobutane. We can make one butene or two butene, and which would be more favored? Two. two, two. two. If our leaving group is on a tertiary carbon, so if we had two methyl, two chlorobutane, there are three alpha carbons now, right? The two of them are identical. So out of these, which would we expect to see? Green or blue? Green one. <clears throat> Same logic, right? There comes a point, this is another case of competing variables, because there are a total of six hydrogens that could be attacked to give you the blue product, right? There's only two possible hydrogens to give you the green product. At equilibrium, if we let this go to long enough so that it makes the most stable product, it's the green product. But the first one before me. But there's a light, there's a higher probability that the hydrogen that gets pulled off is the blue hydrogen, giving us the blue product. So that's an example we call thermodynamic control versus kinetic control. If you slow the reaction down so that you get the most stable product, it would be the green product. However, we can control the conditions to make the blue product instead, because there's a total of six possible hydrogens you can grab to give you the blue product. So just probability wise, if we had such a strong base that it's gonna react with whatever it runs into, then it's gonna make the blue product first actually, preferentially. If we slowed it down and had a weaker base, we can get it to form the green product. But we're getting in, we're splitting hairs at this point. The more stable one that we would expect to see would be the green product. All right, and then last but not least, what are the products that we can form here? Our alpha carbon is not the same one that, or sorry, our active carbon is not the one that has the methyl group. 
So this was our active carbon. So we can make that molecule or that molecule. Right, so be paying attention just because it having the chlorine on the carbon that has the methyl group gives us a different, slightly different product, right? That gave us our Hoffman product here, looked like that, with the methyl attached here instead of these two. And out of these two, this is the one we'd expect. That's the Zaitsev product. But here we're running into more of the problem that we had in the last reaction than others on one hydrogen. That was on, yeah, they, uh, yeah there's only on the one hydrogen, hydrogen here, here. Okay. and there's three. So it's a three to one ratio versus Correct. a six to two. But there's more sterics. There's, there's more sterics. The more reliable way we have of controlling Zaitsev versus Hoffman is actually by controlling the base than it is by looking at the number of hydrogens. So for the most part, we're going to do, we're going to rely on that. Okay. That's going to be our most important variable. There it is. Saint Seb's rule says the most substituted alkene will be formed due to alkene stability rules. More substituted alkenes are more stable because they've got more extra electron density around them, like you said. Like weight in the boat as well. Yeah. You want the weight in the middle so you're not going up or down. These alkene groups or alkane groups around the alkene, they're considered electron donating. So that's what we talk about the hyperconjugation we get with the carbocations, right? And these carbons that are part of the alkene, they're actually your short electrons. Carbons would be more stable if there are more electrons around because you could make more out, um, more uh, sigma bonds. So having more electron donating groups around, more alkane groups around stabilizes them. And you can think about it like, like weight in the boat, it's, but it's more about being able to give electron density in an area that is, is missing electron density. We haven't run into one of the two high bonds yet. Correct. So that would displace the boat. <laughs> I got it wrong. It was not two F's, one N, it was one F, two N's. That's what I get for going from memory. Um, it's good enough. <laughs> the, all those Hoffmans, they, they all are going to show up in lots of places. Um, the Hoffman product in this case is basically if, if our base is big and bulky, like that's the, the classic example that we talked about. We get these numbers to flip between the Zaitsev and the Hoffman product. And it's called the Hoffman product because Hoffman was the one who figured this out. Zaitsev came up with the rules for alkene stability. And so the, the more substituted one is the Zaitsev product. And then the Hoffman product is the other one. And you get that by using these big, bulky bases. They still have to be a strong base. We still need them to be able to go in there and grab a hydrogen pretty well, um, but they can't get to the interior of the molecule as well because these three-dimensional shapes, it's harder to get something that's that's really big and bulky that close to that close to it. Um, it's a good analogy. If you're if you're trying to uh, unlock a padlock that's on the other side of a chain link fence, you don't want a whole bunch of stuff on your keychain, right? It's doable, but it's a lot easier if you have just the key to get through all of that. My my organic chemistry professor called it spinach. Spinach is just all the stuff that's around the active area that you don't care about, because the spinach is the least important part of a salad, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but he, he would regularly refer to it as the spinach. Don't worry about the spinach, or the spinach is getting in the way. Um, he's also the one who called resonance and benzene rings like six magical ponies chasing each other around a, a corral. <laughs> we used to write down, we, we called his name was Shellhammer. We had Shellhammerism, so we would write down in our notes when he would say things like that. I, his name was Shellhammer. Um, and he was. Like He's also the one he, he practically was a cartoon <laughs> character. Um, 
my favorite was was the story he told about uh, wow well, if you have I mean, you're talking about pepper spray versus um tear gas so if you have the choice always go for the pepper spray tear gas is way worse when we asked him when we asked him how he knew that he said, well my wife went to uc santa barbara in the 60s with the thing, and that's, that's where you <laughs> lips it that's a good answer. <laughs> um, so if we are forming these, these elimination products, these, this is the dichotomy that we want to pay attention to. We have to choose between more substituted and less substituted. If it's eth a ethoxide or smaller, go with the ZSEP product. So it's hydroxides, if it's um, amide, it's just NH2 with a negative charge. Um, anytime you get something that's T-butyl or larger, then you're going to make the Hoffman product is the favorite one. So this one, I, I think I missed a, uh, oh, there was a white box that was obscuring these. <laughs> so you didn't see that. Um, out of these, they're also stereoselective. So regioselective means choosing where to put the pi bonds. Stereoselective means you make the cis or the trans. And that, there's a couple of factors that go into that. This starts getting complicated, um, especially for E2 reactions, for these concerted reactions. For E1 reactions, it's pretty basic. It's going to follow the same rules we see here. Which which it already has. Which one's major? Which one's minor? How would you justify that? Probably just because the minor product there's more stereo. Yeah, it's going on with the groups inside. These things are pointed in the same general direction, so they're going to push it against each other a little bit. Not a ton, but enough that you can say that it's a measurable difference. Probably sixty forty or seventy thirty or something like that. And E1 is going to have the same issue, right? E1, when you're going through a, a carbocation intermediate, everything's free to rotate wherever you want. So it's going to naturally arrange itself to minimize sterics before you go through that, um, before the base comes in and forms the pi bonds. So when in doubt, pick the product that has less steric inter interactions between the two sides of the alkene. Um, so that, that can change. That's one that on a case-by-case -case basis, you just have to look at it and say, okay, out of these two, on the two, two things attached here, I've got an ethyl group or a hydrogen. And on this side, I've got a methyl group and a hydrogen. I need the two bigger products out of those two to be facing the opposite directions. All right, so think about it in terms of in assigning priority. Um, you know, your larger from each side have to be pointed in opposite directions for the major product. The tricky part is that some E2 reactions are not stereoselective, they're stereospecific, meaning you don't get a major and a minor, you get only one of them, which means that there's something else going on here that makes it even a little more complicated. And it has to do with those alpha and beta carbons. So in this case, this is a, a molecule you've got where we have stereochemistry to start with. We've got a chiral center. Really, we have two chiral carbons, the active carbon and the alpha. Again, with the lack of consistency in the textbooks. Um, our leaving group, our active carbon has stereochemistry, as does the, the beta carbon next to it. If that's the case, usually that means there's only one proton on the, on the alpha carbons. And they have to be arranged in a certain way, so basically so that we get that backside displacement. So the same similar logic to SN2. SN2, we would not have our nucleophiles, say if we had our nucleophile, 
it's not going to come in and attack the same side from the same side as the bromine as the leaving group because there's too much going on, right? It would preferentially come in here so that we get that umbrella flip, right? However, when we have an elimination reaction happening, We need everything oriented in such a way that your hydrogen that our base is grabbing has to be coming, has to be 180 degrees from the leaving group or close to it. Oh, that's a safe path of least resistance. It's, it actually has more to do with the electrons at this point than the sterics. For the SN2, we just said sterics, there's just too much stuff in the way, right? In this case, it actually doesn't matter what, how big the objects are, it actually matters because you have to have this bond and this bond and this bond all have to be in the same plane. If they're not in the same plane, then you can't have electrons transferring from one orbital to another orbital well. So even if that methyl was not heat butyl, it would still have to go right opposite from you. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think about flipping this the other way so that the hydrogen is up, that also can happen, but now it's the sterics, right? Um, where you can't have your, your lone, your hydrogen is gonna naturally need to be facing away from your leaving group so that you have room based on where all these electron clouds are, right? So you need all four of these atoms to be coplanar, basically flat. And that means that you can only, it doesn't matter what the sterics look like as far as your product goes, if this is the case. You basically, your bromine leaves, your hydrogen leaves, and everything just flattens out where it is. So taking this molecule, you'd wind up, we'd wind up with a carbon carbon pi bond between here, the active carbon and the alpha carbon. And then we'd have a a phenyl group, I, we, I don't think I've used that terminology before. pH is short for a phenyl group or benzene ring, just like ME is short for methyl. We will only get this product. So not a major minor issue specifically just this product because they have to be and the mathematicians get picky they don't like using the term coplanar because coplanar means they have to be in exactly the same plane and chemists figured out that as long as they're like close to the same plane it's good enough close to right right so roughly <laughs> right so for chemists that's good enough but mathematicians said no that's not coplanar what are you talking about <laughs> so they invented a new term I don't know if it's specifically for this, but it, it, the term periplanar, because the mathematicians are pedantic, we have periplanar, which means coplanar-ish. And so that only winds up being an issue if there's only one hydrogen on the alpha carbon. As long as there are two hydrogens on the alpha carbon, then you don't have that stereospecificity because the, you could pick either of the two hydrogens. Right? This one, because this, this base or this alpha carbon only had one hydrogen, we had to put it in the right orientation for this to happen. As soon as that methyl group is another hydrogen, then we can rotate this phenyl wherever we want because we have two options for whichever hydrogen goes there, right? So this is a very specific case. Um, and we really are getting into the weeds a little bit. For the most part, just look at sterics. However, something to remember is you do need to double check that there's at least two hydrogens on that adjacent carbon. Wait, could you go back to the other side real quick? Because what, uh, 
if it was rotated around where like the hydrogen is facing up where it's kind of in like a you know, it would be an unfavorable Newman projection, but this one is as well. It's less so, right? Because so it's the opposite interactions, but rather so if we had it set up like this, so that they're periplanar, yeah. So that would have been the methyl forward exactly, and the phenyl group back because that's just such an unfavorable state that because of the hysterics. That. Yeah, they don't just like with SN2, we don't see it coming from the same side as the leaving group. Okay, it's always going to be the opposite side of the leaving group, just like SN2. Yeah. So, just sitting as a molecule, this looks like it's more stable as you just drew it, but correct under the influence of the nucleophile, it would shift to make it more preferable to do the so proton, right? Remember that we're not these aren't static, right? They're not just sitting in the most stable conformer, right? They're constantly spinning. You, if you can picture taping a quarter onto one blade of a fan, if you don't have any power on, it's just going to sit with the fan with that heaviest blade down, right? When you give it the power, it's going to have some sort of wonky rotation where it's spending more time with the with the quarter at the bottom because it's going to be slowed down when it's coming out of that, right? But that doesn't mean that the other states don't exist. They're just less favorable. So even though this is not a favorable Newman projection necessarily, not the most favorable Newman projection, it is a Newman projection. And at room temperature, these things have enough, enough rotational inertia that they're constantly twisting and spinning in the other directions. Just like our, our chair versus our boat cycle hexanes, right? The chair is the most stable, but that doesn't mean the boat doesn't happen. Just if you picked a molecule at random, there's a slow, a less, or a um, higher, chance of higher chance of it being in the chair form than the bow form. But there's a fine, there is a possibility it's in the bow form if you pick a molecule at random. All right, so this is, and this is more detailed. We got a little bit out of order. Um, you can have anti-coplanar versus syncoplanar, and that's exactly what we were just talking about. Anti-coplanar or anti-periplanar, if we're being careful, <laughs> um, is what we actually see happen as far as the reaction. Even if syncoplanar is more stable based on the, uh, this is the more stable complement. And so if you have something that's not anti-coplanar, when, when you first draw it and you look at it, you need to take it and rotate it to get it to be anti-coplanar. And then we could say, okay, the bromine and the hydrogen leave, everything else just flattens out to get your stereoisomer. Is this only for E2? E it's so only for E2. So it's really a just a very specific subset of these reactions. E1 doesn't matter because it goes through a carbocation intermediate. Mm -hmm. E2, but there's two hydrogens on the alpha carbons, doesn't matter because there's more than one stable way you can, you can be anti-coplanar. This is really very specific, but it winds up being significant enough in synthetic chemistry trying to make a you know, getting the right stereoisomer winds up being a really big deal um, in a lot of pharmaceutical applications or nutrition applications. Like this is the difference between trans fats versus um, unsaturated, regular unsaturated fats, right? The only difference between them is cis versus trans, and yet there's a huge health impact. Um, so it winds up there's a reason we're spending this much time on it, even though it seems like it's kind of a niche case, because it winds up being an important niche case. All right, we'll end there. We'll start here um, with practice, and we'll go through this one more time and look at these again so that you see it again and do some practice with this on uh, Thursday. Um, lab at one, be able to finish finish last week's lab, weigh the product. Um, and get those numbers and then uh, 
as and this is a fun lap we're getting this is a really cool one making essential oils um it smells good too it smells like thanksgiving because it's going to be lemons and cloves <laughs> this smells like cider to me anyway <laughs> 